Um, we'd love to know where you're joining us from. So please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat box, indicating your name, country, and organization. Uh, we've gathered here today to present OGP's new memorandum on parliamentary engagement and the accompanying guidance to explore the opportunities for parliaments not only to strengthen their own openness, but to play their part as a key actor in advancing open government reforms at the national and local levels. To do that, we will share a short presentation about the memorandum, the policy itself, and the new materials. We will then have the honor to hear from reformers who are working to reform parliaments, open up parliaments, to share their experiences and some reflections with us. Uh, we hope all the other participants will continue throughout this conversation to share not only your questions for us, for the speakers, but also share your reflections and experiences from your work in engaging parliaments in the open government agenda in your country context. So since OGP launched, parliamentary engagement has been a very critical uh, aspect of achieving ambitious open government reforms. Many of the landmark reforms in OGP were enabled through parliamentary action. Today, key aspirations of the open government agenda, whether it's pursuing rights-based approaches to open government, institutionalizing reforms, defending democratic processes, or promoting and protecting civic space, uh, or indeed you know, the response, recovery, and renewal from the COVID-19 pandemic all require the support of parliaments. Different branches and levels of government have already been increasingly involved in OGP processes uh, that are coordinated by the executive in many country contexts. That involvement by the parliaments and more uh, recently the judiciary ranges both from actively participating in national multi-stakeholder fora, leading commitments in the national action plan to convening or co-convening their own co-creation processes. Engagement of parliaments in OGP, whether through the formal uh, means of participation and co-creation or other means of coordination and collaboration, really stands to benefit all OGP stakeholders. For parliaments themselves, it can provide an additional mechanism to hear from citizens and civil society between electoral cycles on how they can better serve the people they represent, stay up to date on the government commitments uh, and hold them accountable to them, Internationally, OGP can also provide a global platform for peer learning, accessing expertise from OGP's vast network of practitioners, and for showcasing successes. For the executive branch, there's a benefit too. Parliamentary engagement opens up opportunities for securing legislation that will enable executive branch commitments, for resourcing of implementation through the budget appropriation process, and for institutionalizing reforms by codifying them in law. And finally, for civil society, Parliamentary engagement is, is a crucial aspect for, of course, securing the sustainability of reforms across political administrations and cycles, um, for advocating for citizen interests and rights directly with parliamentary representatives, but also in reducing the transaction costs of engaging with lots of different multi-stakeholder processes that are all trying to work towards the same objectives. After 10 years of learning through an extensive, uh, of, of 10 years of parliamentary engagement in OGP, um, we ran a very extensive consultation process throughout 2021 uh, with the OGP steering committee approving an updated or a renewed policy or a memorandum as we call it on parliamentary engagement in late 2021. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the effort of many partners, civil society leaders, uh, parliamentarians and parliamentary staff, including many of you on this call uh, for your contributions into that process and review. Um, this memorandum and the new direction that we are taking on, you know, under it is the result of your collective efforts and experience, and hopefully will allow the whole OGP community to benefit from a clearer uh, and more flexible framework for parliamentary participation in OGP. The memorandum uh, primarily identifies four areas for strengthened parliamentary engagement in, in OGP. Uh, so let's take a moment to look at each of these. The first, uh, is it sets out a legislative action as a key area in which parliaments can make a difference. Uh, parliaments can champion open government values by introducing, reviewing, ratifying legislation relevant to open government or approving budgets for open government reform. So there are several examples of such engagement in OGP already. Uh, for example, in Armenia and Nigeria, we've seen the role they've played on enabling legislation on beneficial ownership transparency. In Kenya, Paraguay, on a right to information legislation. 
um, several such examples of how parliaments are already through their formal and informal engagements contributing by uh, taking legislative action are abound in, in OGP. The second area that the memorandum identifies is the role of parliaments in strengthening parliamentary oversight in holding governments accountable for their open government reforms and opening up their own oversight processes to public scrutiny. Uh, here we've seen examples from Kyrgyzstan and Liberia where parliaments have formally committed to legislative oversight of the OGP. In Georgia, we have seen commitments where the parliament is improving the transparency of the oversight of government debt. So again, we are seeing this is an area we haven't seen uh, as much traction as, as the others, and one where we are hoping that with the new policy direction, we'll see more parliaments engage in this manner. There are a few examples, but merely not enough to make a tangible difference just yet. The third area of parliamentary action is, of course, what has traditionally been the foray of the open parliament agenda in OGP. Um, so this is about opening up parliamentary processes, um, a focus, as I said, of many of the first generation um, parliamentary action plans. So this is parliaments adopting open government principles, um, that of transparency, accountability, public participation and inclusion in the parliamentary institution and processes themselves. So we've seen good examples of this in, in Chile, for example, where parliament committed to increasing the public traceability of legislation through a new online platform and drafting regulations on the active publication um, of information. Uh, we've also seen examples from places like Estonia, where parliament has committed to improving their practices of publishing legislative committee meetings online in a timely manner. Um, so the public can benefit from understanding what, transpi you know, what transpires at these legislative committee meetings and hold their representatives to account. Last but not the least, um, parliaments have an important role in fostering cross-party dialogue around emerging issues relevant to open government. Um, so for example, in the Netherlands, um, the executive committed to, um, you know, putting forward legislation around the transparency of online political campaigns, but obviously that needed a uh, cross party, cross parliamentary support for that to actually be adopted. Um, so with the support of partners like International Idea, um, a series of dialogues between political parties was held within the House of Representatives to advance this work. We are seeing similar examples uh, around the regional Escazoo agreements, the climate agreements in, in the Americas, where the parliaments again have an important role in building cross-party um, support and, and support that will uh, overlast, so support that will extend beyond particular political administrations to ensure the sustainability of this, of course, generational reform that is being consider considered. Um, on the, the, the new and updated parliamentary section of the OGP website, uh, we have uh, several such illustrative commitments that parliaments that are considering engaging in OGP can consider, as can civil society and executive branch representatives who are trying to get parliaments involved in this agenda and are looking for specific examples of what exactly parliaments can do within OGP. So that was on the, the substance of parliamentary engagement in OGP that's laid out by the memorandum. Let's now turn to the mechanics or the models of engagement that are provided for in the new policy framework. So the first is participation of parliaments in the national or local OGP processes. Um, this is both the most popular as well as OGP's preferred model of engagement, whereby different branches of government coordinate to achieve common or specific goals. Now, our evidence from tenure shows that this promotes much more ambitious reforms, which are also better implemented, simply because you are able to get complementary actions from different branches of government when these actions are closely coordinated, while, of course, keeping in mind um, principles and practices around separation of, of powers and, in, and how that might define uh, how tightly or loosely this can be coordinated in any particular country context. Um, so in this framework, parliaments can include commitments or a chapter within the OGP National Action Plan, so long as the co-creation process is joined up or closely coordinated between the executive and the parliament. Um, so the idea is not focused on the substance of what comes out, you know, whether it's just a few commitments or whether it's a separate chapter. This model really emphasizes that regardless of the manifestation of those commitments, that there's a process that is closely coordinated between the executive and the, and the legislative, as well as in some country context, uh, judicial and other branches. 
The second form of participation um, of parliaments is through the submission of standalone uh, OGP parliamentary action plans. Um, this is for those parliaments or those country contexts where parliaments need a stepping stone towards participating in the national process or see value in co-creating their own plan in addition to their engagement within the national process. Um, sometimes parliamentary calendar cycles are you know, not well-timed with the executive calendar cycles. This might be an interim solution before finding a way in which those things can be synced in the future. The third and final uh, element of engagement that the memorandum uh, outlines is the recognition that you know, there's a lot happening in the space. Not everything needs to be coursed through uh, OGP action plans or the OGP platform. Uh, so one thing that's very important to emphasize here is that parliamentary engagement is not mandatory for OGP countries. It is strongly recommended, but ultimately it is for each country, government, civil society, parliament alike, to determine what works in their context. Um, but even for those parliaments that are not formally participating in OGP, either through the first national engagement model or through the standalone model, um, the, the model foresees uh, creating spaces for peer exchange, for knowledge sharing and, and learning from each other's efforts for those, uh, for those parliaments as well. This will also be extended to parliaments from countries that are not yet part of OGP and therefore cannot be formal members of OGP. Um, so the knowledge and learning pillar of, of the of the engagement will be much broader than OGP's membership itself. Of course, putting that to practice will take some time, but certainly the aspiration is to make sure that that is as wide and open a club as possible. We've seen uh, many good examples of the joint effort or the participation in the national local process that um, we mentioned um, earlier, where parliaments, executive, uh, in many countries now, even the judiciary collaborate in a single co-creation process to promote openness. Um, so, you know, there are just a few examples of this uh, on the slide you see, um, but one that stands out is the bicameral group of transparency in Chile, which worked with civil society in their latest action plan and included commitments both around the transparency of the Chilean Congress, but also access to information legislation. The, the support unit has developed some guidance materials for stakeholders interested in balancing parliamentary engagement through this model. Um, the first is the document, um, which is the, the menu of options for participation in national OGP processes. Again, this is the recommended form of parliamentary engagement. And what this document um, does is give you uh, the ways in which parliaments can be engaged in the OGP process, right from uh, you know, the awareness raising and outreach phases all the way down to implementation and monitoring of action plans. Um, there are no major changes in rules for engagement under this model. Uh, most of the rules are the same as under the previous OGP parliamentary policy that was in place before 2021. Um, just key things to remember are that co-creation of parliamentary commitments or chapters must be coordinated as part of a single action plan process. Uh, commitments that are offered by the parliament uh, through their participation in this manner uh, will be evaluated by the independent reporting mechanism in line with the current methodology. Uh, there will be no standalone evaluation of the parliamentary co-creation process, but there will be a single evaluation of the process um, and the commitments will be treated in the same manner as, you know, as which the IRM treats other commitments in line with the prevailing methodology, which as you know, those of you who are familiar with us know, we do keep updating the IRM methodology from time to time as well. Here again, there are a variety of methods to engage from formal to form, informal, closely or loosely coordinated. Um, so what the guidance document does is simply present ideas and good examples on different ways for parliaments to engage uh, in this manner. Um, the second model is where there have been um, several changes. Um, so the, give me a second, let me go back, right? So uh, the, the second guidance document is a document which uh, guides participation, sorry, tech challenges. Yeah, it guides participation under uh, model two, which is the independently co-created action plans by the parliament. Um, again, this is ideally only in those contexts where engagement in the national process is not possible or where it's desirable to have an additional parliamentary process. Um, parliaments opting for this option must notify the support unit in writing 
um, and the national or the executive POC and the MSF will also be informed so that they're aware that the parliament is commencing uh, such a process. Uh, we're also asking that going forward that a parliament liaison, so sort of the parliamentary counterpart of the, the OGP POC is appointed so that there can be smooth coordination between the support unit and, um, and, and the parliamentary administration, but also so that actors who are interested in engaging with the parliamentary efforts have a single point of contact who they can communicate and coordinate with. Uh, it's very important to note that there are several changes in the rules and guidance around the co-creation assessment and reporting of these action plans. Um, this is where the new, um, the new policy really uh, has set out a, quite a bit of a, a, a different approach in how we are seeing um, parliamentary engagement. Uh, we heard throughout the consultations the need for more flexibility for parliaments. Um, so this is offered in, uh, in a variety of, of ways. Um, so at minimum, uh, parliaments have to notify uh, the initiation of the process to the support unit, as I mentioned. Um, this can be done via informing the, the, the regional coordinator that is in charge of the, of the country. You can see this on OGP's website or through Rosario Pavese, who is now a senior parliamentary advisor uh, leading the agenda for the OGP support unit. Uh, it requires the formal appointment of a parliamentary liaison. Um, this is a person that can be within the parliamentary administration. Uh, it could also be someone from, um, you know, the from parliamentary membership itself or for MPs themselves. But ideally, it's someone from parliamentary administration to ensure continuity over over time. We also encourage. Uh, it's not required to have a parliamentary lead that is an MP or a group of MPs who can also take political leadership over the agenda. That, however, is not a requirement. Um, the third minimum requirement is that parliaments will have to provide evidence for opportunities for public input and feedback during the action plan development and implementation. And then finally, um, there are some requirements around timely submission of assessment reports by parliaments uh, you know, taking this approach. So based on the feedback we received, uh, you know, there's a lot more flexibility as you can see on the screen. Uh, parliaments can determine the duration of their OGP parliamentary action plans. Uh, we require a minimum of a year for the effort to make sense. And ideally, I um, recommend that these plans do not extend for more than four years. They can be submitted at any time of the year to the OGP support unit based on whatever is optimal for the parliamentary calendar in, in that particular country context. Uh, and we ask that once the action plan length and delivery period are selected, that you aim for consistency as much as possible across cycles. There are also new templates here for the action plan narrative and the commitments. Um, these are designed to enable greater reflection and action on the different roles of parliaments in advancing open government. Um, the roles that we mentioned before around legislative action, around parliamentary oversight, opening up the institution itself, but also its agenda setting role by fostering cross-party dialogue. So the templates uh, you know, for the action plans, for the commitments, these are available in, in the guidance document I mentioned before. We will be sharing all these materials with all our registered participants um in in a follow-up email but they're also available on the new parliamentary uh web page that i i mentioned before and i'll ask one of my colleagues to pop the link in the chat uh, in the next few months we are hoping that we will be able to create the opportunity to actually e-file um parliamentary action plans that are received through this process um doing away with sort of large vld pdfs uh, but more on that later, if you're planning to submit a parliamentary action plan in the next couple of months, you know, do let us know so that we can have an interim arrangement in place. And last and, and final, um, this one is very important to note, uh, these standalone parliamentary action plans will no longer be assessed by the IRM. Um, the model now offers three options for assessment. One is parliaments can choose to carry out their own self-assessment. Um, second, they can engage independent offices um, you know, the Ombudsman or Parliamentary Research Services, or third, go in for a third party assessment um, a model, much more on the, the, the guidance, the principles, you know, how each of these might be carried out, as well as templates for these are in the, in the, in the parliamentary guidance documents that I mentioned earlier. And here we are looking at three moments of these assessments being carried out. One is at inception, uh, by that we mean within four months of the parliamentary action plan being adopted. A second, we recommend a midpoint check-in for action plans that are uh, on the longer side. 
Uh, and then the third is at the end of the action plan period, an assessment and a learning exercise within six months of completion of the parliamentary action plan. Um, so lots of changes in, in this particular model. Uh, we've heard in many countries the difficulties of getting the parliament and executive coordinated in the initial phases of exploring engagement. So hopefully uh, this opens up avenues for those of you who are joining us from countries where we know this has been a challenge or where for whatever reason, um, the, the, the agenda on the executive side might be dormant for a while, but you might see an opening in the parliament for the parliament to proceed in this manner. Uh, very important to note that of course, um, membership requirements of, of, of OGP uh, and procedural review and voting and all of these kinds of uh, formal rules based uh, parts of the governance of the partnership as of now still will rest with the executive. So parliaments will not be subject to procedural reviews um, you know, they will not have separate voting rights and steering committee elections and the like. Um, but again, hopefully that is uh, compensated for by the flexibility that this model now introduces, particularly in countries where we've seen it difficult for the parliament and executive to coordinate. Um, similar options also on the on the local side. So local parliaments have several options for participating in, in, in the OGP local members that we have. One is to the inclusion of commitments in the local action plan, quite similar to the national model. Uh, the second is to the co-creation of a joint action plan. And this is an option that becomes available starting June this year. Um, and the third is to the submission of a standalone OGP local or parliamentary action plan. This is an option that will become available only uh, next year onwards. And there will be a special call for interest or proposals uh, for parliaments to engage in this manner. So, more on the local front forthcoming. But of course, uh, you know, regardless of whether parliaments are offering commitments, uh, you know, co-creating standalone plans or co-creating joint action plans, um, they can continue to engage in the OGP local agenda by supporting outreach and awareness raising, engaging in the co-creation process by advising on legislative processes related to commitments, as well as helping the advancement of implementation, either through necessary legal provisions or for ensuring appropriate budget allocation. Um, so on the local front, the materials and guidelines are still being developed, but this is just a rough preview of what's to come. Uh, and the, the alignment that we are seeking between the ways in which local parliaments or local councils can engage in, um, in OGP local uh, with the ways in which national parliaments can in the national process as well. Um, so that's it in terms of the, the policy framework, the, 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 the changes that have come with the new policy um, memorandum in 2021 and some of the guidance, guidance materials. We hope that you will uh, engage with these materials and reach out to us with any questions you have, uh, but also ways in which we can support uh, bringing in parliaments into OGP processes in, in your countries uh, and help you in, in advancing uh, those efforts. Um, so I'll stop there um, for now and turn now to, to hear a little bit from some of our um, speakers for today, you know, if you have any questions on the presentation, please keep them coming through the chat. There will be a Q&A segment later uh, as well. But for now, I have the honor of introducing uh, two very special speakers. I'll start first with um, Lumina Mentari, who is, um, you know, Open Parliament staff at the House of Representatives in Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia is one of the Asian countries that has pursued an OGP uh, parliamentary process, uh, you know, for a few years now. So, uh, Lumina, a very warm welcome to you. And if you could tell us a little bit about how the Open Parliament Indonesia process uh, coordinates with parliamentary actors, how do you engage civil society in your processes, um, but also perhaps your reflections on how there can be a closer cooperation between the Open Government Indonesia and the Open Parliament Indonesia agendas. Uh, so over to you, Lumina. Um, thanks so much, Rhea, for uh, sharing everything uh, for the new uh, engagement policy. Um, so I, I'll just directly share my screen for the presentation. Um, um, so uh, actually before uh, the parliament, I was serving for the open government initiative as well. So I crossed from the government to the parliament uh, side and there, uh, and when the open parliament initiative was uh, declared, uh, I was 
also there uh, transitioning from the government to the parliament. So before I uh, share our experiences, I will just give you a bit of context for uh, the timeline of open parliament in Indonesia. So after uh, the OGP has been declared, uh, the IPU actually um, have um, already encouraged parliament to support open parliament initiatives and all of uh, the policies uh, related. And uh, in Indonesia, uh, for uh, in 2014, uh, the commitments have been engaging with our parliaments, uh, although they're not uh, as ambitious or as um, involved involving parliaments as deeply as we wanted. And a lot of the parliamentary uh, commitment has been discontinued. And um, that goes for uh, the national parliament and as well as the local parliament. And when it was uh, at the momentum in 2018 where the parliament uh, or our MPs were uh, more um, spirited in uh, supporting this kind of reformative programs. And that's why they support um, mostly on how to bring on, uh, how to accelerate and empower more on the agenda for uh, an independent open parliament initiative. So that's why uh, it has been a long process and it uh, for the open parliament itself. And we're just still building, uh, uh, as is like a still building a start for, uh, for open parliament today. So, when we first declared, there have been placed um, many in, uh, many uh, mechanism for legal policy and also uh, organizational institution. So uh, in Indonesia, we have a team of MPs that will support open parliament uh, initiatives that consist on MPs across the factions, and it's lead it's led by uh, the vice president the vice speaker of the political and security. And we also have a secretary team uh, from the administration, from the secretary general that will implement and uh, uh, fill in the more technical role and policy roles uh, for the action plan. And through uh, this collaboration, we have engaged uh, CSOs. Although we have not uh, create a more institutionalized uh, practices as in the government, because in the government we have a specific decree uh, between CSOs and uh, the government. Uh, with an open parliament, we only share more on project collaborations and MOUs, which uh, which is very limited to certain types of uh, thematic issues and uh, certain types of projects. But uh, we're trying to align more into a, a, a more binding uh, resolutions in the future. So we can make uh, CSO's particip participation in the action plan more inclusive and more sustainable. So here are our team of MPs that uh, supports open parliament uh, initiatives. Um, uh, we have involved um, most of them on uh, activities for open government week and uh, our action plan. So uh, we, uh, but sometimes uh, there are some challenges in engaging on uh, their political will and their political commitment, especially when uh, the factions especially controls a lot of um, uh, their uh, decisions in uh, supporting in, uh, in the legislation. Um, so this is just the same as uh, the, uh, what uh, I previously talked about. And uh, for the coordination with the open government, uh, because I was in open, uh, open government uh, before, we actually have uh, a lot of uh, interactions and a lot of collaborations together. So there's no problem in communication, but we do have a, a, a specific groups for, for WhatsApp because Indonesian government and officials mostly uh, contacts via WhatsApp groups. So we have uh, coordination through WhatsApp and we have a, uh, uh, consultation um, sessions with uh, the government and also the CSOs. Just uh, this morning, I've joined on the CSOs consultation on the next uh, action plan for the government. So uh, our coordination is basically fluid and there are formals and informal interactions. And of course, we are we also always collaborate on Open Government Week and also their uh, activities. So we try to... Uh, morally expose the parliament to towards government initiatives and government commitments so uh it will go in line with the legislation as well so um the next is 
So there in in building an open parliament initiative, there there has been a lot of um, you know uh, building that legal foundation on how uh, what kind of policies that are already in place in supporting the open parliament, and what are there uh, what is the lacking of the policies and what uh, what policy we need to strengthen. So uh, mostly most of the open parliament uh, initiative is uh, basically done uh, through. Uh, because we have a regulation for the team, we also need more improvement in a regulation on uh, the formation of legislation and legislation on uh, uh, regulations in um, the parliamentary organizations, parliamentary code of conduct, and as well as aligning those to the uh, bureaucratic reforms and secretary general strategic plan. So there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of um, moving parts uh, through making uh, this initiative possible just to serve the secretary general interest, the parliamentary interest, and as well as the CSO interest. So that has been a challenge uh, in placing uh, the action plans and our initiatives. Um, but we we have uh, come to like a specific uh, goals and visions, especially making legislative process more transparent, uh, more participative, and uh, a lot of that has uh, come through this uh, initiative. So uh, from it was declared until now, the parliament has keep increasing um, their uh, processes and keeps uh, making um, the legislative process more open, more uh, inclusive to uh, comments and feedbacks. And we have also improved uh, the, the visualizations of data and information so people will be interested to use uh, our applications. So that has been a, something that we uh, already agreed upon. Uh, and we also uh, really heavily focus on uh, building a certain data center, a, a data support for the parliament. Because uh, in our parliament, most of our data comes from the government. So a lot of MPs and the parliament itself uh, heavily rely on the data from the government. And they don't have their own independent data uh, mechanism or data sources. And we want to uh, empower those processes so they can gather uh, more data, more uh, aspirations, more participation from uh, the public. So they can gather their own data and compare it to uh, the government and uh, strengthen that debate and scrutiny. Um, uh, the priorities that we want to focus on um, in the future is, uh, well, basically the most feasible one is just re redesigning um, our website and applications that are that seems to uh, still have many challenges, many um, unsatisfied uh, performances from the public. Um, so we, we try to uh, focus on that. And the second one is uh, building a more open spaces on um, public uh, participation and aspirations and that that seems uh, to be needing a more stronger political will in the future so hopefully uh, we will uh, try to push more on that and the third one uh, will be on mainstreaming and that will co uh, align with uh, what OGP will want to in the future is to uh, putting a, a congruency on between the national uh, between the legislative and the government uh, action plans. So a lot of uh, the policies that we want in the open parliament is to be mainstream through the committees, through the legislative processes. So uh, uh, people will have a more open mindset on that. Uh, although there are uh, many challenges in the parliament that we still face uh, and it's uh, directly uh, in, it directly affects uh, the open parliament initiatives and all of the action plans. The first is uh, about the elections because um, elections and political transition uh, equals to a risk of uh, failed programs, discontinuations of programs. We have seen it uh, 
really directly before uh, when we first launched um, the Open Parliament Initiative, we have a, a really great application called DPR Now, which uh, where uh, people can give their aspiration directly. And it's a really interesting application uh, uh, to help uh, just an engagement between MPs and the people in the public. But unfortunately, because there has been uh, a political transitions and has uh, uh, transitioning leaderships and all of the programs are scrapped and the third uh, the second one is um the leadership changes and their political will and commitment uh we have witnessed it here too uh, during uh our time in 2019 and 20 um our um our leadership for open parliament uh, which is uh mr aziz here in the yellow uh in the yellow background um he was unfortunately um involved in a corruption case and he was um dismissed from the leadership and then uh, it influenced um the budget cuts for the program for his next uh, successor. So that is what uh, uh, some of the risks we have. And the third is um, there has been a lot of dynamic changes in support system where uh, there uh, have been uh, changes in the administration and as well as um, the administrative uh, leadership in the Secretary General. So uh, which makes uh, really difficult for implementation because we need to repeat and sometimes we need to reiterate again and again to the new uh, leadership as new administrator and that has been uh, a kind of uh, bureaucratic hassle in our part so i guess uh, that's just a, a quick bit from uh, indonesia i hope um, it'll be uh, it will offer sufficient insight on all of the challenges and implication of open parliament initiative so i, I i'm guessing because uh, Indonesia context is very different uh, from other countries. Hopefully you will have uh, a lot of experience that will teach us uh, for a better understanding and better practice for open parliament. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, um, Lumina. I mean, what's uh, clear from your presentation is of course that uh, achieving results from this agenda is, is immensely complex and difficult in countries uh, particularly in an environment of democratic backsliding, in an environment where we are seeing political uh, challenges to this agenda. Boro has been really impressive about the Indonesian cases, how quickly you capitalized on the interest and in, uh, enthusiasm of a, a handful of parliamentarians to at least set up the infrastructure to be able to keep this dialogue alive, to find the reformers within the system, connect them to civil society. Uh, and I think that is quite interesting, perhaps for a lot of other countries. Uh, we hope that in your priorities, you would also consider other elements um, that are put forward as the, you know, in the memorandum as, as areas of, of action. Uh, and looking forward to seeing what comes out of the open parliament and open government Indonesia efforts in 2022, where you're both co-creating, of course, uh, action plans this year. Um, so I'm sure there'll be questions uh, based on what you've shared and, and we'll also be happy to share our speakers' details with participants if you want to follow up bilaterally as well. Um, before we take go to the questions and please keep them coming, thank you, Indra, for, for getting us started. We will turn uh, to Caroline Gaita from the Maslendo Trust. Uh, Caroline, you're of course from civil society. Um, Luminat spoke about elections. This is an election year um that you're you're working through on both the government and the parliamentary side so tell us a little bit about as as a civil society organization how are you trying to bring these branches of government together in advancing open government uh and some of the the efforts and initiatives um, Maslendo trust has uh, taken forward uh, over to you Karen. um thank you shreya let me i'd say that i would not share a screen but i think i should just so that um, it's much easier to organize my thoughts. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I've been asked to look at I've been asked to look at the civil society role in supporting the co-creation, the implementation, and because today we are also talking about open parliament, and Kenya has been one of the countries that's already implementing an open parliament commitment. I'll speak about that. Maybe very quickly for those uh, engaging with us for the first time, just some bit of a background. Kenya has been um, joined the process since inception of OGP, that's in 2011. We've successfully implemented three action plans and are currently implementing the fourth one. 
Um, a common denominator around the, all the action plans has been commitments around open contracting, beneficial ownership, public participation, data, and uh, more recently, an access to justice commitment, which is the first time that we're having that. Um, just like the National Action Plan 1, our current action plan, the fourth one, is also a transitional uh, NAP in the sense that it's, it's being implemented during a process when we have elections. And therefore, one of the key considerations we made and we've been making as we move along in the implementation phase is how we ring fence that and ensure that there's institu institutionalization of OGP in the process. A quick look at the open parliament commitment in Kenya. I think for us, the difference is parliament has been a key actor within the national action plans within inception. In fact, a review of the four action plans will show that every, every action plan has had a commitment that's been co-led or co-facilitated or co-created with parliament. Um, also from inception, our members of parliament have always have participated in the OGP summits. One of the ways within which civil society and, and the MSF in generally has engaged with parliament has also been making through presentations to sittings of uh, parliament, in this case, the Senate. We've involved parliament in the co-creation process. And allow me to say here that in our fourth action plan that we are currently implementing, parliament actually has um, a leading role in one commitment that speaks to public participation and legislative openness, but is also a co-lead in three other commitments. And this speaks uh, a lot to the pre pre presentation share made about parliament playing a very key role in, in uh, either advancing legislation or oversight or provisions of budgets. Um, another success area within open parliament has been an establishment of an OGP desk. And again, under the current action plan, this has been upgraded to include a task force that is wider and, and broader in participation. Under the current action plan as well, the, the speakers of the two houses have made a commitment. Um, they did a forward that's in the current action plan. They sit in the steering committee. And currently uh, one of the senators actually leads the process and has consistently made presentation to the Senate in terms of OGP commitment. I thought that background was important so that to then we put it uh, we marry the two to see what uh, role the civil society is playing. Um, so Muzalendo Trust, we premier uh, parliamentary monitoring organization. And it was interesting to see that Lumina also started her slide with the role that uh, PMOs played in, in kickstarting the conversation around open parliaments and Muzalendo has been part of that. We've been interested a lot in um, areas of access to information, public participation and legislative openness. But broadly, uh, institutions such as ours and other civil society organizations continue to play a key role in supporting the OGP process. And in the next slides, I just show a quick um, summary of how we do this. So um, OGP being a co-created process, We've looked at um, how both civil society organizations and the other actors from government, from private sector, from academia benefit. So um, again, in, given that you know, the, the, the values and principles of which if OGP, inclusion, transparency, civic participations are core to a lot of the civil society organizations work, especially working in accountability, this, this, this has not been hard to do. And so we've been involved from um, in the entire cycle of co-creation from um, the meetings that um, the multi-stakeholder forums that help us identify what new commitments would be to the meetings that uh, are um, develop the co-creation processes, develop the commitments and the, and, the, and the milestones that come out of it to the implementation process and also to the Review, uh, the review of the process. Continuously, civil society organizations have acted as a bridge between the government actors the, and the private sector to make sure that the OGP conversation is kept alive. And we do this through continuous meetings, through continuous engagement. Here also <clears throat> important to mention that for us, the approach that we've taken is a cluster model 
where, for example, under the current action plan, we have eight commitments and each of those eight commitments is led by a government and civil society lead and then has uh, a litany of organizations drawn from um, different stakeholders. Again, the government, the CSO, the private, the academia, the media, that then form part of the supporting participants per cluster. What this does is that it helps clusters to, to develop, uh, in addition to developing the commitments and the milestones, to then develop work plans that will help uh, keep track of the, of the implementation of the milestones. Um, so I think I've spoken around this. What other roles have um, CSOs done? I think mainly in the first, uh, uh, facilitation of the co-creation process to make sure that the commitments are ambitious and they're inclusive. A lot of this has to be informed by data and evidence and CSOs um, do facilitate a lot of this. Again, um, like in most spaces, funding remains a constraint, especially around the co-creation and the, the implementation of OGP. And so CSOs have often provided the much needed resources to ensure implementation and part of one of the ways civil society organizations do this is mainstreaming, mainstreaming <coughs> the milestones within their programmatic activities. So if, if, if um, you have a commitment on open contracting, for example, you find that a lot of organizations that are working <coughs> on open contracting are ensuring that those, those, those activities are feeding towards the national action plan and therefore those are met. There's also the aspect of coalition building and partnerships where we put together resources and engagements and expertise to make sure that we are all tracking the progress in terms of the implementation. Um, I think I ought to have done uh, a slide. Um, I think I've really spoken about this in terms of identifying priority areas based on evidence we identify issues that are responsive to national interest and, and speak to them. We mainstream OGP activities into programmatic areas. This ensures that um, um, you know, resources are utilized well and that commitments are captured in work, uh, work plans. And then I've also spoken about the resourcing the process, stepping in the gap, you know, ensuring that things like meetings, benchmarking processes, documentation, this is done. Um, again, um, when it comes to co-creation and beyond uh, co-creation, I think there's an element of awareness creation and onboarding process. And this has also extended to the parliamentary process. Um, so one of the areas that we've done, for example, around open parliament is making sure that um, the, the, secret, the technical staff of parliament are aware on OGP. We've had um, sessions. The members of parliament are also aware, and this speaks to the uh, the thing that I mentioned earlier, for example, making having an OGP sitting in the house and making sure that reports on OGP are made in the house. We've also done capacity building, learning and sharing of media government actors, including parliament, for them to then be able to understand OGP. And then ensuring an inclusive participatory process during the co-creation process. And for the open parliament commitment, again, emphasizing that um, because our open parliament's commitments are captured under the proposal one within the action plans, then making sure that this is um, parliament is fully informed and aware of the members, both at the technical level and membership level. And then I've spoken about data, ensuring that the commitments and milestones that are finally agreed upon are informed by evidence-based information and through research. Um, and also finally providing leadership in the process. So being a co-created space, civil society leads um, CSO elements of the commitments while the government and other sectors lead from the other side. Um, what are some of the challenges? I think this mainly um, cuts across maybe insufficient funding, especially for implementation. So sometimes we have fantastic commitments and milestones, but the 
uh, the, the, the resources that are required to implement uh, these or to set the necessary teams, whether you're talking about a parliamentary task force, that has not happened. Um, sometimes onboarding new partners has taken long than anticipated. And then speaking to the question that um, was asked at the beginning of my presentation, the challenge on ring fencing the process from uh, political processes, you know, or, and it's not just political, sometimes you find that the key leads in institutions, whether government or civil society, maybe the, the points of contact in those institutions owned and ran with the OGP agenda. And sometimes when they leave the organization, then they, that slows down within the political space, ensuring that the office that convenes the process has convening capacity, but then again, when politics interfere with that process, there are delays. And the ways, some of the ways we have tried to do this now, especially under the current action plan, we, we position the current action plan as an institutionalization action NAP. This means that we are making efforts to make sure that um, institutions have, um, have uh, either a desk or a team or a caucus that is going to take the OGP process going forward so that uh, even post the elections in August, the process continues and should lead uh, staff or lead technical people also depart from those offices, then there's, um, you know, so, sort of handover reports and institutional memories on the progress that has been made. The other way around it is also just making sure that we are speaking, you know, we are speaking to different actors within the political process to make sure that even as uh, people are making plans for government, uh, or for an incoming administration from either side that then we are ensuring that the OGP agenda does not get lost and is part of what is transitioned to the next administration. I think uh, basically that's it in terms of, uh, in, in terms of the slides. And just to say that um, I think the model of having public, uh, I mean, an open parliament commitment within the national action plan is, is, is a fantastic model because it makes sure that, um, it, it makes sure that um, parliament is not only, um, and is, is not only focused on their own, um, you know, action plan or their own commitments, but they have a key role. And giving an example from Kenya, some of the successes we've had, for example, in ensuring an access to information act, um, ensuring that open contracting is mainstreamed within government processes. Part of that has been because members of parliament have been part of the conversations. And so when we've gone back to them to, to, to make a case for some of this legislation, that has been successful. In the last action plan, we had a, a commitment to pass a, a public participation legislation. The members of parliament that were the leads within the action plan committed to making sure that that happens. It, it does happen that they sat in the Senate and sure enough, a public participation legislation was passed at the Senate. And although it has not been um, uh, accented to or passed by the National Assembly, the fact that that was um, catalyzed as a result of some of the commitments that have been made within the National Action Plan, I think makes a case for a, a bigger role. Um, I think also the element of budgets, you know, ensuring that resources are being set aside to, especially for the government counterparts to make sure that they can implement the commitments, um, ensuring there's a mechanism through which um, OGP issues are reported in parliament has been um, a, a great way. Last year, we had the Senator who leads the OGP process, for example, use the OGP uh, mechanism to ask questions around issues of COVID, utilization of COVID funds and making a case for open vaccination. So I think it's a fantastic uh, way of ensuring that the commitments are made, but most importantly, being a co-created process, civil society organizations have a key role to, to play and, and to make sure that then they are tracking the commitments that, and, and the progress that is being made in the implementation of the commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, um, Caroline. Right? Like in, in so many ways, 
what you're highlighting is that the engagement. I can't of, hear you, Shrey. I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Is audio coming through? I can. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you as well, Shreya. Carolyn, it might be at your end. Everyone else can hear fine, right? Yes. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, all right, we'll wait for Karen to be able to get audio back again, but I think in so many ways she highlighted uh, the benefits of having the parliamentarians engage in the process going much beyond just the commitment that comes out of that kind of engagement, but also the other ways in which support can be um, garnered for the rest of the open government process um, in, in Kenya. Um, but also elsewhere. So thank you for that. I think the, the other important thing coming through was the role of civil society in ensuring continuity across political cycles uh, in the outreach and awareness raising phase. Um, but important point, of course, highlighted both by Caroline as well as uh, Ollie in the chat box about, you know, none of this is free. Um, funding is a concern and how can organizations that are interested in this work be able to mobilize um, resources. I think that's that's one worth uh, asking about. So I'll, I'm not sure if Caroline, you know, if you're getting audio again, you are okay. Perfect. Um, I am. Thank you. Great. Uh, so thank you both, Lumina and, and, and Caroline, for those uh, very insightful uh, reflections on what you've learned from your experiences in Indonesia and, and Kenya, respectively. Of course, one of you from the parliamentary administration uh, viewpoint, the other from uh, civil society parliamentary organization viewpoint. Uh, we invite all of you uh, who've been listening in to share your questions. We'll start with taking the ones that have come through uh, for now. So we we'll begin with the questions that uh, Unral from Mongolia has, has put forward around um, the relationship between the OGP memorandum and the declaration on parliamentary openness, uh, the number of countries that have signed up to the memorandum, uh, and a few questions around uh, co-creation of action plans and, and the timeline of action plans uh, under the second model of engagement. Um, so this is actually a, a, a really good and important area of clarification. Uh, the declaration on, on parliamentary openness is of course something that we have uh, been disseminating and encouraging countries to sign up for since it came about. Uh, but the declaration itself is not an OGP um, initiative or OGP held initiative. Um, it was an initiative of the Sunlight Foundation, the National Democratic Institute, and the Latin American Network for Legislative Transparency. Um, so um, there is no formal relationship between the memorandum and the declaration, even though OGP has been very supportive of the declaration being adopted by countries over the years. Uh, Sunlight Foundation, as some of you who've been following this space might know, uh, you know, has been sunsetted. So we are not entirely sure if the declaration is kept, kept up to date and if there is being outreach that's done actively around the declaration itself. Of course, the Latin American network and NDI continue to promote those principles and support that work in, in, in the many countries they operate in. Um, substantially, I think the difference also between the declaration on the parliamentary openness and the memorandum uh, of, of, in the OGP memorandum is this, that uh, the declaration focused primarily on opening up the parliamentary institution and, and processes. So the openness of the parliament uh, with the memorandum, um, the direction that the steering committee of OGP is trying to take is looking not just at the openness of the parliamentary institution, but the other complementary roles that parliaments can play in their legislative role, in their oversight role, in advancing not just what comes in and out of the parliament, but also from the executive branch of, of government. Uh, and the third difference I would say is the memorandum is not one, it's not a charter or a declaration we're asking countries to adopt. Um, simply put, it's the policy document of OGP on how parliaments can engage. Um, there has been a lot of um, debate and discussion sometimes around when a country signs up, does it mean that the executive branch signs up? Does it mean that it signs up on, on behalf of all state institutions? Um, this is not a debate we thought we would be able to settle. Um, so what the policy does is at least try to outline the ways in which parliaments can engage in the uh, OGP agenda. Um, so well, we are not expecting sign-ups to the memorandum. It's a policy framework. And with it, there is accompanying guidance for countries to be able to take it and implement in their own context in the way that makes sense. Um, 
what we hope it does, it, it gives civil society and government and parliamentary actors who are interested in the ability to point to something and say, this is how you can participate in OGP. Um, on your questions around the co-creation of action plans, um, you know, will this be independently by the parliament without other parties? Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, what we mean by the standalone parliamentary plans is that we are now under the new policy allowing parliaments to convene their own co-creation process at a timeline that works best for the parliamentary calendar in that particular country context. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, the previous policy absolutely required that parliaments submit their action plans jointly with the executive in a single document. And that posed many problems where parliamentary calendars were not aligned with the executive calendar or where you had one, one willing branch of government, but not so much the other. Um, so if that is the case, what this policy just simply does is allow parliaments to do this at their own timeline. Uh, but as with all things OGP, the expectation is that this, these plans will be co-created with civil society. And unless parliaments are able to provide evidence that it was open to that public input, that it was open to co-creation, those plans will not be accepted. Um, and in terms of timelines of plans, will they be accepted at any time? Is this realistic? To be honest, it's an experiment. Again, this change is in response to the fact that many parliaments and civil society organizations working with parliaments found that you know, the August or the June deadlines we had for executives to submit their plans didn't necessarily align with parliamentary calendars. Uh, so we've simply said, you know, if there's something that makes sense from your budgetary timeline or from your parliamentary calendar sittings timeline, it's fine to pick, you know, whether you're going to submit plans in August or September or December or Jan, any time of the calendar year, really. But once you pick, then you remain consistent over the years, unless, of course, there's an election year in which timelines are impacted. Uh, and again, these are plans that are, you know, one to four, um, between one and four years. Um, this is not so different from the executive plans now, which can be two or, or four years. Um, so, Indral, I hope that answers your questions. If not, of course, please keep them coming. Um, there's a question from, um, from Oli around the need for funding. And, and Caroline, maybe I'll come to you, right? Um, of course, like, like you said, like limitations in funding is something that is a persistent challenge. But what has your, been your experience in Maslendo in terms of getting resourcing for this kind of work? How can it be diffused beyond the PMOs who probably have the first line of access to some of the funding available for this kind of work. So perhaps your perspective and, and how you have resourced the work that you've done uh, over time, and then happy to come in with sort of what might be available through partners. Okay, thanks. Um, thank, thanks, Shreya. I, um, for us, like I said, um, it's perhaps just trying to see how we, we take some of the commitments that are directly aligned to our work but it's, it's a tricky situation because we, we do play uh, a role as the CSO lead and therefore coordinating the CSO activities within the OGP, which means when we are looking for resources, they must include those that will help us uh, mobilize, coordinate, document the success of OGP overall. But now within the specific commitments of our work as a PMO that speaks directly to commitments around open, opening up parliament, whether it's development of, the, of specific civic tools, facilitating citizen engagement in legislative um, processes, engagement with the parliament itself, it's seeing how we mainstream that within our work. And perhaps for us, it's been slightly easier because then the commitments also speak to our strategic objectives. But beyond Muzalento Trust, we see that also with other civil society organizations. So uh, an institution like Transparency International Kenya is very strong on open, open beneficial ownership. And therefore within their funding, they have secured resources for beneficial ownership that extends to the action plan. Partners such as HIVOS and Development Gateway, strong on open contracting and therefore using the OGP place as the entry point for their work in that area. And so we see it across it. So if it's Article 19 and access to information, uh, NAMATI and partners on access to justice. So I think uh, perhaps it's when, when, you, when you're putting together the multi-stakeholder forum is to make sure then that um, as you agree on commitments, key organizations that are working in that area 
you know, uh, are also part of the process because that then makes it easier for them to run with some of the commitments and action points and ensure they get resources within their programming. Hey, thanks so much for that, Karen. I know you also have to drop off for uh, an important meeting soon, but thank you for joining us. And of course, we will look forward to many more exchanges where you share your um, share your insights. Um, there are a few other questions. Yeah. So thank you very much. So I'll switch um, to the phone and uh, I hope to keep engaging. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. And I also hope to get the presentations and yeah. For Indonesia, I think we'll also be getting in touch. That was a very powerful presentation and there are some lessons there for us to learn as we also try to strengthen our open parliament commitments. So thank you very much. And sorry, I have to step out, but we'll keep no, talking. Absolutely. I mean, you're stepping out to do the things that you've been talking to us about. So uh, thank you, Karen. And of course, we'll uh, share materials and also put you in direct contact with, with, uh, with Lumina to share um, lessons. Um, there are a few other questions. Thank you, Karen. Uh, there are a few other questions coming um, through. So um, question from Ziad around whether this memorandum has been communicated to all member governments individually to obtain their interest and if civil society uh, wants to take it forward, what support is available? Um, so that's again a good question, Ziad. So yes, the memorandum um, after the series of launch webinars this, um, this week and last week uh, will be shared with all OGP points of contact and uh, civil society members within multi-stakeholder fora. Uh, I mean, you know, knowing the, the context from which you're asking this, of course, where the executive process has been dormant for a while, uh, we'd be happy to work with civil society to share it with parliamentary contacts who you think this might be of interest with, uh, for, who, who might be interested in this. Uh, and in terms of the support provided, you know, it's, I think it's um, it's it's sim of a similar nature as the support on the executive side. We'd be happy to do uh, work alongside you on, on outreach and awareness raising. You know, familiarize parliamentary actors and civil society uh, with the opportunities, the value propositions, what they might be able to get, but also the details of getting a process up and running. Uh, as I mentioned, of course, the IRM is not part of the offer for the standalone process. Uh, in a country where the joined up national uh, process with both executive and legislative might not be possible. Uh, so get in touch if you think there might be a bit more space uh, to pursue this conversation with the, with the parliament now or in, in coming months, uh, even if it can't be routed via the executive branch of government at this particular time in, in, in the Sri Lankan context. Um, question from Lumina on support from OGP for empowering parliamentary CSOs and PMOs. Um, I think Lumina, I'll probably come back to you to ask about what kind of empowerment you're, uh, you're, you're looking at uh, so that we can understand those needs better. Um, and on your second question of if there's a way in which we can strengthen and exchange practices for open parliament network. Uh, absolutely. I think this is something that perhaps I did not um, emphasize enough in, in, in the beginning. Um, one key finding from the review that we did in 2021 was that actually there's a lot of rich um, rich experience, a lot of diversity of approaches. There's a lot more happening on the parliamentary engagement front than anyone realized, uh, certainly us at the support unit, but also in the steering committee. Um, so aside from you know, the flexibilities offered with the, with the new policy, an emphasis is going to be uh, towards A, integrating parliaments uh, within policy discussion. So it's not like, okay, here's the space for the executive government and here's the, the, the space for the parliament parliaments, but also to have more continuous dialogue and exchange between those who are um, participating in, in open parliament processes. So still some discussions around what's the best format of this. Of course, there will be you know, webinars and, and, and peer exchange workshops like this that we will be ramping up over the course of this year. Um, but for that ongoing communication, you know, is it the Indonesian way of you know, a giant WhatsApp group? Is it a mailing list? Is it a discussion forum? I think those mechanics, again, we will rely on the wisdom of this community to tell us what you will find most useful to engage with. Uh, but let me come to you, Lumina, on clarifying perhaps in terms of uh, what is the empowerment you're, you're, you're seeking uh, because certainly, you know, we think the actors on the country level are much more empowered than any of us at the support unit. So let us know how we can uh, understand that need better. Um, 
so for the empowerment, uh, I, I was trying to sentence on uh, uh, for the CSOs in the government, for example, they they have their own secretariat. I, I think Darwanto has left. Uh, so uh, I, I was just wondering, uh, should we have like that kind of uh, mechanism where the CSOs has their own independence and they, ha they have their own institution in uh, just uh, bringing some targeted and thematic uh, issues uh, with the parliament? So uh, there, there has been a lot of, um, you know, uh, as we know, like there has been a lot of conflicts and uh, uh, there's a, a lot of controversies between CSOs and which one gate or gatekeeping type uh, in the CSO. So we want, we just want to know what is the best strategies so that the CSOs can uh, bring in uh, more of the aspiration, their projects, and we can fairly uh, serve them and uh, within our capacity. So that's. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because I think um, just as in some in in some cases we've had the parliament and the the executive siloed in 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 their approach to this. Sometimes we've seen that siloing between CSOs, right? So the parliamentary monitoring organizations are dealing with the parliament. Everyone else is dealing with the with the executive process. Um, but where we see the opportunity is actually to also break down that silo within the civil society space, because especially, uh, again, um, knowing the Indonesian context where you do very extensive public consultations, you go out often to, um, you know, um, regions as well to get, gather inputs from grassroots community based organizations. Uh, it's a bit of a shame if what you hear goes only to the executive branch. There's a, the linking role that CSO can, CSOs can play in terms of being able to bring forward insights that could also be part of the parliamentary process consideration and not just the executive process. Uh, so certainly in our engagement with civil society that are engaged both on the parliamentary processes where they have been standalone already, uh, but also on the executive side to make sure that they're aware of the shift from the OGP side and the kind of um, you know, information, materials, examples, peer, uh, peer contacts they'd been you know they'd need to be able to to do that uh, we'd be very happy to 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 support that thank you so much thank you so much thank for you, the answer yeah any other questions from our participants feel free to raise your hands or put them in the chat box Give it a minute or so. Um, Shreya Undra. Yes, Undra. Go for I would it. Like just, just to say, uh, first of all, congratulations on this new initiative on the, this memorandum. The OGP came up, but <laughs> but always it's coming when OGP, when OGP there is an issue on OGP. I always the, the word but comes in Mongolia, especially. Um, uh, as I understood, the OGP is the, the members of the OGP are the governments, right? Uh, and I, I don't, maybe I, I don't know, I don't understand it widely, but how, how the OGP is planning to bring in or to, to raise the interest or commitment of the parliament yeah. to that. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question, right? So I think there are a few few different uh, modes, right? And again, I will answer keeping in view the Mongolian context, uh, understanding why there's a but <laughs> behind behind your uh, original statement. Um, it I think the way in which it will be approached will differ from context to context, right? On the one hand, you have the Kenyas where Parliament has already been quite actively involved, uh, and there the focus of our outreach or our engagement will be much more along. What is it that they could do differently in terms of the, the, the breadth of the way in which parliaments are engaging, right? Um, then we will have country cases like but with Mongolia, right? Where you have had, uh, of course, a, an executive branch led process with starts and stops and challenges. Um, but partly because of that, you know, bringing on a parliament to that same timetable, to that same co creation process, uh, Unral, you made valiant efforts in this regard earlier on. Um, but has proven challenging. Um, so what we'd be happy to do with within these cases is um, use that second model, which actually in a way helps in these contexts where you don't have a very stable, um, smooth, up and running kind of uh, executive branch led process, 
to see if there is more willingness uh, from the parliament side to co-create and convene their own process. So it creates another avenue. So if you, for example, Unral, give us, uh, you know, you know, people within the parliamentary administration or, or, or MPs or the chairperson who we should write to, uh, outlining this opportunity, connecting them to peers and seeing if we can start a parliamentary process uh, to start with at least in parallel, but if, you know, ideally if, if things improve, um, joint up over over time. So you're right, it's the government that joins, but the problem with this, the term the government that joins is that there's never been a, a universally accepted definition of what government means in this context. Um, the original 40 odd countries that joined in 2011, they're very split on these issues. Uh, there are some countries that say when a country joins, it means it commits all of government, meaning all branches of government. There are other countries that say, well, no, this is the executive branch joining. So there's no way you can compel the parliament to be part of this. Uh, it didn't seem like a definitional debate that we'd be able to res resolve yet. Uh, there is an ongoing strategy process, as you know, through hope, you know, which we could use to bring clarity on some of these vaguer issues. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, what it does allow for is for parliaments to separately engage with OGP as long as they're part of an OGP member country. Um, so this will not extend, for example, to countries in the Asia Pacific region that are not members. For them, co-creating plans with an OGP brand will not be an option, or we will bring them into knowledge sharing and exchange. Does that answer your question, Adran? Oh, yeah. Thank you. But in this regard, the OGP has to have, I don't know, oh, to plan a big, big <laughs> visit to Mongolia with CEOs, with all the support team around to Mongolia and to meet the face to face with all parliamentarians or Dandan Shatar speaker or whoever, etc. But I like I like the idea of the open parliament more than better. I look forward to them because they have a power of with the resources, for instance, like you. Know. And the concept of government in Mongolia is very strict. It's executive branch. We are separate. The parliament is separate, you know. So I hope if the open parliament will start working in Mongolia, it's better than government will work up to now in Mongolia. Hope so. Hope. Thank you. Fingers to us. We hope both work over time. Um, I mean, we. I think the country visit is definitely a priority. You see IV and you know IV and you know how to find on multiple platforms. And that's part of the plan. The visit will have to be big in its intentions. The support unit still remains small. Uh, so it'll be a small group of us, uh, but hopefully uh, with a big agenda. So more on that later. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come through on chat. Of course, uh, this has been a lot of information, a lot of changes, a lot of materials. We'll follow up with all our registered participants with um, both the presentations from Lumina and Caroline, as well as the support unit presentation, but also some of the accompanying guidance and materials we uh, referred to. This is very much the start of a process. Uh, it will take time for us to ramp it up, uh, but we hope many of your countries will join us in this journey. Uh, a very, very big thank you to, to Lumina and, and Caroline for sharing their experiences with us today. Um, uh, I also want to um, remind everyone, if you're not already aware, that OGP is in the process of uh, refreshing its strategy of developing a new strategy for the period of 23 to 2028. We have started some consultations around this, uh, which some of you have been able to join. There will be many more coming up. Uh, we are also encouraging all our stakeholders to hold these conversations within their own communities. I'll ask my colleagues to pop up the links uh, on the chat, so we hope um, that you know this conversation on on how we can get a key actor in the in the open government agenda engaged also triggers your thoughts on what that might mean for OGP's strategy going forward. Um, you know beyond the parliamentary policy. So an invitation for all of you to to you know engage, uh, organize your events, but also watch the space for opportunities for participation in upcoming events that we'll be hosting or co-hosting. Uh, once again, a big, big thank you to all of you for showing up, for your questions. Uh, keep them coming, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully um, see the start of a conversation to get the parliamentary peace trend in. Um, in um, I, I see there are colleagues who joined us from Asia Pacific, Europe, Africa, so I would say globally and not just in this region. Um, thanks once again, and enjoy 
the rest of your afternoons, nights, mornings, uh, and see you again soon. Bye for now.